Hi, my name is Dr. Richmond Lowe and I'm the fish vet. Today we've presented with four Oscars with what looks like the worst case of hole in the head disease I've ever seen. We're going to do a whole bunch of other tests to see what is the cause because there could be more than one thing wrong with them. So we're going to describe to you what the classic clinical signs for hole in the head is. And basically, hole in the head happens around the lateral line system. So you can see here, these are pits ordinarily uh, with the lateral line. They normally use them to detect vibrations in the water. And so this is fairly early. Uh, you can see the pits getting gradually getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and these are the other parts of the lateral line. So with cichlids, uh, one of the signs is that determine that they are cichlids is that the lateral line on the body splits into two separate lines. So we move over to this next fish where the uh, disease is more advanced. So you can see the pits are a lot bigger and deeper and it's involving more of the pits around the head. You can see there and even at the top of the head it's starting to get worse. And we'll move to the third fish. Um, so this fish here. So we'll move. This is the third fish. So this is the sort of the progression of the disease. You can see it's a lot bigger and deeper uh, in terms of the erosion that's happening, and the fins are starting to fray. We'll have a look at it in there. And this might be secondary bacterial infection kicking in. And in a very advanced stage, we'll move over to this other fish here. Here what we've got is an advanced case of hole in the head. You can see it's very deep pits where the lateral lines are, the erosions. And it's actually starting to uh, ulcerate. You can see redness, hemorrhage ha happening. Uh, all along the body so this is very advanced. A lot of people always jump to conclusions that if you've got a hole in the head it's due to hexameter and we need to treat with metronidazole but a me uh, hole in the head is a multifactorial cause uh, so we're going to determine do a lot of other tests check the water quality check the fish check the feces check the environment and its diet to find out why exactly it's caused. What did we find from water quality tests? Uh, we found the pH was okay at 7.0, uh, the general hardness was okay at about 11 degrees, uh, but a few of these things are a bit out of whack. Um, the carbonate hardness for example was at 2 degrees, so it's not something that will kill the fish, but it's uh, that the whole tank is at risk of swimming in acidic water because if you don't get enough buffer in there, the pH is going to drop overnight uh, without you even knowing. Uh, other things that were out of whack was the ammonia. You can see trace levels of ammonia. This was at 0.5. Um, it doesn't kill the fish, but it does cause significant stress. And the nitrite as well, it's one level up. So you can see trace levels as 0.1 uh, milligram per liter. Uh, and these two things can stress, and it really tells you that the filtration capacity uh, for this tank is definitely inadequate uh, for the amount of food or, or the biomass that is in living in the water. Uh, the nitrate was adequate at about 25 uh, ideally with these guys you want to keep it below 50 so in this case it looks like the person's doing enough water changes uh, to keep this low enough next we're going to do microscopic examination of the patient we're going to check the gills and the skin look for any evidence of active parasites that might be causing them additional stress we're going to check the feces uh, to check for evidence of fledglets and we're going to check the actual lesions itself we're going to take the scrape we're going to stain them up look for bacteria or any evidence of other parasites and we're going to take swabs of the ulcers to check whether there's a secondary bacterial infection and what's useful about the swab it's because we want to determine whether there's a primary bacterial pathogen uh, identify them and also run an antibiotic sensitivity panel to determine what sort of antibiotics would work best Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to take some skin samples and gill biopsies and to examine them microscopically. Well, this is actually quite severe. You can actually see the gills through the actual hole itself. Have a look at that. Wow, that's pretty severe. Okay, so what we're doing here, taking gill biopsies, so lifting up the operculum, you can see actually the gills are actually a bit anemic. It's actually quite pale. Um, so we'll just take a tiny bit, just a pinhead size bit of the uh, primary filaments um, 
and then we take a skin scrape so we're just going to lift up the pelvic uh, pectoral fins um, take a sample again from just the base of the dorsal fin and then at the caudal peduncle and this is to look for external parasites so what we're doing here is we're scanning along looking at the gill filaments this is at four times magnification uh, including the eyepiece is 10 so that's 40 times magnification you can see the uh, gill this is a primary filament looks healthy uh, ish and scanning around looking for motility and once you spot motility like you can see here uh, you then zoom in the next objective is um, 10 times objective that means it's magnifying it up to a hundred times uh, so this is a gill fluke um, you can tell it's a gill fluke because it's uh, leech shaped uh, and you can see to the top right here if we scan in and out you may notice some eye spots there should be four at that end and it's got some haptors small ones uh, towards the bottom left uh, which what it, is what it uses to hook or latch onto the fish with uh, these guys are egg producers so you need to do multiple treatments to be able to um, attack the susceptible stages to the drug that you're using so now what we're looking at are the fecal samples that we've collected um, looking for any evidence of motility that uh, signal that it's going to be hexameter or we're going to look also for um, worm eggs and looking at it here looks all clear not finding them doesn't totally exclude it because they may not be shedding uh, but if we see evidence of these then it is a causal factor for a hole in the head. So we found nothing on a general mucus scrape uh, under wet preparation. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a precision scrape using a scalpel blade uh, off the cavities of these hole in the head lesions and then we're going to stain it up and then view them under a more powerful microscope. So I'm doing, I'm just going to scrape the lesion. To make this cytology smears. And then when you're taking the swabs, the surface needs to be clean because otherwise uh, what you're going to do is you're just going to grow the bugs that's in the water and that would definitely complicate the laboratory findings. So after you've done a scrape, that's the ideal time that you take the bacterial swab. Okay, so after preparing the mucus scrapes, we're going to make them air dry uh, and for the staining process so that we can actually view them down the microscope. First step is to actually fix them in methanol, so that's what this first solution is. So you just do about 5 to 10 dips in here or you can leave it for a certain time. But if you move it up and down, uh, the process will take quick, a lot quicker and the methanol is to um, coagulate all the proteins, uh, make the material the sample stick to the slide and not fall off because you can see it's a lot um, in the process of staining a lot of solutions um, so you don't want your samples to fall off so the second part is to stain the material red uh, so it's really good uh, to get um, for to be able to view the cytoplasm the cytoplasm of cells uh, tend to take up the red stain uh, and nuclei as well um, and then this is the blue bit of the stain uh, called difficult solution number two and this is good to stain up nuclei um, and any sort of bacteria that's there. So you do that until the, for these things until you get a nice clean film uh, coming down the slide. Uh, that's when you know you've done enough of dips. And the last one is just to rinse off all the dye, uh, leaving the background nice and clean. Next, we're going to look at the stained preparations down a more powerful microscope. So here we're viewing the cytology smear prepared from skin scrapes and diff quick stained and you can see all these large purple cells they belong to the fish host uh, got macrophages, epithelial cells and red blood cells but right in the center of this field you can actually see the bacteria so we're just going to zoom in uh, to show you how small these bacteria are 
and you can see them here they're rod shaped uh, probably some sort of an aeromonas but uh, really a bacterial culture is what's going to be used to be able to identify them so these are real rod shaped bacteria staining pretty much dark purple or blue almost black okay so what we've found so far the holes in the head uh, we didn't see any evidence of hexameter but what we found is we've got poor water quality with ammonia and nitrite um, traces of them and we've found bacteria living in the skin ulcers and we've also found gill flukes. So how are we going to treat this? Uh, we're going to send the client home uh, with some medications for their hospital tank which is a 4 foot 200 liter, 280 liter tank. So firstly we want to address the uh, gill flukes. We're going to use Prezi Quantil. Uh, for his tank it's going to be 1.4 grams. Uh, so we're using it at 5 milligrams per liter and we're going to use it every seven days so with a partial water change in between uh, the reason why we do four times is because the parasites are egg layers so we want to target the parasites at their susceptible stage together with that we're going to address the bacterial issues that are on the skin uh, causing the ulcers now we're going to use oxytetracycline i'm going to use this at 40 milligrams per liter so for this eight, uh, 280 liter tank, uh, it's going to be 11.2 grams. And with antibiotics, we always do a course. So not just a single treatment, but uh, just as when you get sick, uh, the doctors prescribe you a course. We're going to do three treatments, three days apart, use with partial water changes in between. To help with healing, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give some vitamin C. So here we're going to use it at about 10 milligrams per liter. So it's roughly about 3 grams uh, into a 280 liter tank of water. And we're going to give that uh, every time you do a water change. That's to top it up. Helps with wound healing and to help with the immune system to fight off any infections. And with them in good clean water without ammonia and nitrite, um, these fish should be on a good road to recovery. We've got the bacterial results back from the lab. And what we found is instead of a single bacterial ulcerate causing the ulcer, we found multiple bacterial species in light to moderate numbers. So what that means is that these bacteria are not the cause of the ulcer, but they're just an opportunistic pathogen. To wrap up, we found gill flukes, water quality issues, possible dietary issues. The important part for treatment of hole in the head disease is to address the diet. You need one that caters for the species you're dealing with, and Oscar is a freshwater tropical carnivorous cichlid. So you need a food that has 40 to 45 percent protein. Basically, you go for something that's an established brand. When you purchase it, you make sure you smell it, and it needs to smell fishy or shrimpy, and needs to be fragrant. That way, you know that you're getting good food. And basically, you get what you pay for. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to get updates of our latest videos. Have a fantastic week. Thank you.